Born to fight, born to fly. The U.S. Airborne live in the skies. To get them there, they rely on heavy birds to fly them over the battle zone. Double quick time. After over 60 years of aircraft innovation, their chosen chariot of the moment is still the Dirty Herc, or Lockheed C-130. There's a special affinity for the C-130. We call it Dirty Herc. It's a C-130 Hercules. We call it a four-fan trash can, uh, insulated to keep the noise in, because it's noisy, as, it's noisy as hell. But that is every paratrooper's first love. This is the aircraft that they train with every day. It's the airplane they use in combat operations. For a paratrooper, this aircraft puts the air in airborne. Generally unarmed and unarmored, the C-130 uses its four massive turboprop engines to lift over 40,000 pounds of hardware into action. In airborne operations, its two rear doors allow 64 paratroopers on a static line out of that door fast. The C-130 has everything that a paratrooper would want to see in the aircraft. It has the double doors. It has a large tailgate so that you can use it for platforms, for heavy drop rig, to put large loads, small vehicles, artillery pieces onto the battlefield. The Dirty Herc entered service in 1956 and holds the record for the longest continuous use of any military aircraft in history. That's testimony to just how good this weapon of war truly is. It's their icon, it's the aircraft that they do every jump from, and so to them, this bird gives them the exhilaration of being a paratrooper. I still get chills when I see them fly by around here all the time. To take a closer look at the Hercules origins, we have to retrace the family tree to another aircraft used by the Airborne in World War II, the classic C-47. The Airborne loved it because it was a great aircraft. It, it could withstand a lot of punishment. It was a great platform to jump from and the most modern of any paratroop airplane in the world at that time. The C-47 was affectionately nicknamed the Vomit Comet because of the bumpy ride she gave when nearing the drop zone. Despite the rough ride, the airborne rode her into action at every major airborne operation of World War II. Well, we jumped from the C-47s, and that's the only plane that we knew. We trusted the plane. They were very safe planes. The C-47 could carry a payload of 6,000 pounds. This made it a welcome sight for the 101st Airborne when they were surrounded and without supplies during the Battle of the Bulge. At this point, about all we can do is pray for some kind of help. And oh, what a lovely sight they are. Our fat friends, the C-47s, bringing the guns and ammo we need so bad. This is the stuff to put the claws back in the screaming eagles. Throughout the war, the C-47 would work in conjunction with gliders. Gliders were engineless planes that would allow the airborne to get heavier weapons, more supplies, and even more men onto the landing zone. One of the ways to get a concentrated force onto the battlefield was the use of a glider. They brought to the airborne division jeeps and trailers and artillery pieces and anti-tank guns that they otherwise would not have had on the battlefield. The main workhorse of the American Airborne was the Waco Glider, which was constructed to be as light as possible. It's made out of canvas and aluminum spars on the inside. You can literally walk up to it and put your finger through the skin of a Waco Glider. Once all gliders lost their tow rope, they were on their own. Slow moving with little maneuverability, they were completely at the mercy of enemy guns. When they hit the ground, they could be impossible to control. The body count for glider troops began to climb high. The glider was phased out as a piece of military equipment because it was just too dead gum dangerous. 
helicopters and the birth of aircraft that could heavy drop supplies, armor, and artillery would be the final nail in its coffin.